Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back. Always good to see you and thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you. Today we're actually going to talk about uh, the rental contract and the mysterious uh, rental contract, as I should say, because I see a lot of errors in these things consistently, even from my own agents. And so what I want to do is take about seven or eight minutes today and really go through the contract and massage it and figure out exactly what um, things you know get missed typically and go through the entire thing together. And I'm going to give you a copy of this thing for your reference for the future. So you can use that as a template and you'll never have questions again. And so again, thank you for tuning in. It means a lot to me. If there's other videos I can do for you too, please let me know. Like, subscribe, all that other good stuff. It means a lot to me because it gives me an opportunity to help more people. So let's go ahead and get into the contract. And so quick footnote on this thing. I use Dotloop as my transaction management system. This is what the system is that you're seeing that I am filling out um, the contract on. And so you guys are using Skyslope or using Transaction Desk or some of you are probably using ZipForms. Um, get out of zip forms and use something else. Uh, they're much better solutions for that. But honestly, uh, Dialog is a pretty good solution. I, they don't pay me to, they, I pay them. They don't pay me to say that stuff. So let's go ahead and get into the contract and uh, I'll make it as easy as I possibly can for you. Um, go ahead and look at this thing here real quick. Um, what I'm using is I'm using one of my office listings here and so I just picked this stuff up and literally we'll just use this as a template. Um, it's a property in uh, Arcadia. It's a really nice property and it happens to be uh, partially furnished and it's a beautiful house. So it's just, it's very sexy. We do it for the YouTube. Um, getting in here, Larry, landlord, will be our landlord today. And Tammy, tenant, will be our tenant. Property address, I literally just went in here and I just copied and pasted this thing. So I literally just copied this and then I uh, pasted that in there. And then the city in Phoenix uh, and then state 85018. Personal property to be included and maintained by the landlord. That is stuff that actually has to be maintained by the landlord. So I had an issue uh, literally probably a week or two ago where we had a refrigerator quit. The tenant has been in that property for 10 years and the landlord's like, no, I don't want to maintain that thing. We actually went back and saw this and it was indeed to be maintained by the landlord in good working condition. So yes, that is something that I need to do. And so what you want to do is select the appropriate boxes here. So in this case, um, I'm going to look and see if there's a washer and dryer. You're going to find that somewhere right around here where it says laundry. It does say washer and dryer hookup only. That means that there's probably no washer and dryer, in which case the uh, tenant would need to bring their own. And so let's designate that there. Um, and I know this property has a refrigerator. It does have an oven. It does have a dishwasher. It definitely has a microwave. Quick side note here on uh, line 10, if you have something, you know, like it is a furnished condo or a furnished home, you might want to put an addenda in here or just say other, you know, see furnishing as a list. And then with a complete list of all the furnishings that go with the property. And remember that those are all to be maintained by the landlord. So if there's something that's not to be maintained by a landlord, you should have a little footnote in there kind of covering your butt. Occupancy. Let's just say Tammy's got two kids. So we're going to say Tammy tenant. All right, so I'm just going to say Tammy tenant and her children and just kind of stick that in there. That will avoid any issues. Quick side note on this too. If you've got like a one bedroom condo and you notice that your tenant has two children and she's trying to rent that out, um, that's a little bit of a gray area. Generally, uh, I hate to make generalizations, but generally the occupancy is limited to two per bedroom. And so just a quick footnote on that. Side note, um, talk about Addenda Incorporated. Let's just assume that this is built before 1978 so we can get a little bit into the uh, lead-based paint disclosure, reminding you that you should be sending out the pamphlet for lead-based paint. Uh, you can find that online. Just go to Google and type in lead-based paint pamphlet and it will come up as a PDF. You should also be doing a move in, move out checklist. And I wanna tell you a very interesting story. This thing right here, your phone, is really going to save your butt, guys. I promise you that. Please take videos before and after. It will save you a ton of time and energy and, and money, potentially, if you have to go to court. We had a situation where there was a discrepancy. There was not a move-in, move-out checklist done. And then it came back to us and bite us in the butt when we went to court. Um, so learn from my mistakes, please, and do a move-in, move-out checklist with video. Cell phones are uh, incredible video these days, so there's no reason not to do it. Um, no other addenda incorporated unless you want to do like a furniture uh, inventory checklist or something like that. Lease agreements shall begin on today is March 15th. Let's make it interesting. Let's say uh, next Saturday the 28th, just kind of spice things up here a little bit. Um, and we'll say time. I usually give them like 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. Depends on how early you want to wake up. And so we'll give them keys at 8 a.m. And we'll say this is going to be ending on uh, March 31st of 2021. That gives us 12 months in a little bit extra, just a heads up on that. You can do like a March 28th to March 28th, and that is 12 months. You can do, you know, any term that you really want. I mean, that's completely up to you guys. So time, uh, I usually give them until 11.59 p.m., and that just avoids any issues with somebody uh, moving out late and, you know, goes into the night. 
hey, look, just give them to eleven fifty nine. It eliminates any problems there. So, earnest money. Um, this is a very expensive rental, and we're holding it for a small period of time. I'm going to charge an earnest money. Let's just say earnest money in the amount of a thousand. I'm just going to throw a thousand bucks in there. I don't think um, you know this person is really going to default on that. Quick side note about this too: if you choose to do a personal check and that personal check bounces. You likely have bigger problems. Um, we don't like to see earnest money bounce. I always get it in the form of a cashier's check or a money order, and then I always get that first month rent in certified funds as well. That will eliminate any issues that you have, I promise you, and so it kind of weeds out the bad stuff. Upon acceptance of the contract, the uh, deposit will be held by the landlord. Very simple there. Um, monthly installments, let's go back and see how much this is. Yay, it's $25,000 a month. All right, so we're gonna say 25,000 here plus any, any applicable taxes, which are currently, and here's where we have a little bit of fun, and so quick side note about this too. Taxes vary from town to town. So I'm gonna use Scottsdale taxes. Trying to figure out the Phoenix taxes is probably a little bit more in depth than what we wanna go into in this video. We're looking to just fill out the contract. A little note in Phoenix, it depends on how many units they own, it depends on a lot of stuff. Um, and so I'm just gonna use Scottsdale, which is 1.75%, uh, and so we're gonna charge 1.75% on top of the 25,000, so we'll take 25,000 here times 0.0175. That taxable amount is 437.50. And we're gonna put that in here. All right, I already missed it. It's line number 41. This is where you designate what day of the month that the rent is due. And so go back to line number 41. I'm gonna put in first. And you can put the 28th in there. You know, if you're starting the, the, the thing on the 28th, you can do that and not prorate, but Let's do a proration here, and I think that's gonna be a really good exercise for us. Um, but before we do that here, let's add up this amount here. So we're gonna take the 437.50 times, what, Ooh, plus 25,000, and that's 25,000, 437.50. It's pretty easy math. And then we're gonna to say to um, go into Monsoon here, and we're gonna see who the owner is, and that is Joseph. I'm just gonna copy and paste his name. I think we said Larry Landlord, um, but for this example, just copy and paste. And then you, you would probably want to put at, you know, so he's got a PO box. Um, definitely ask and see, you know, where the rent is going to get sent to. So like, you know, a lot of deals at Optima, uh, Campbell View, we just leave it at concierge or, you know, if the landlord wants to pick it up or, you know, if they want it mailed to a specific address, just do that. Um, just ask. It's a very easy conversation or text message. If, if you don't know, just put TBD to be determined. And so here we're going to put Joseph's, uh, um, you know, P.O. Box here, we're gonna put Scottsdale AZ. Late charges, this is a pretty big rental. I wanna inflict a little bit of pain to make sure that they're paying rent on time, because uh, it is due on the first, and so let's do a late fee of uh, $500, and let's say plus $100 a day. It's pretty dang good motivation to get that rent in on time. And then what we're gonna do here on line 49 is designate either 5 p.m. on the first, or it's gonna be, you know, um, let's just say five days. I like five day grace periods because, you know, sometimes there's holidays in between or something comes up, you know, it gives them a little bit of grace period and it, it reduces that tension just a little bit. Um, and I've found in the past that it just works well. I'm gonna add 38 bucks in here for a um, bounced check fee, that's what that is. And then let's do our, our little proration here. So if we said we're gonna take possession on the 28th, you need to include 28th as part of the rent. The rent is due for that day as well. Let's just count them out, 28, 29, 30, 31. So we have four days in March. Uh, quick note about prorations here. Um, so in the past, I used to do a 360 day proration, so I'll just cut it, you know, and divide it by 30 and figure out what the daily rate is, and then multiply that by four. We would always have inevitably questions from the landlord or from the tenant. Since I started using the actual number of days in the month, we've had a lot less questions. And so ask your broker and see what they want you to do. Ask the landlord or the tenant and see what they want to do, but maybe default. Uh, this is where I hate giving advice like this. Default to 31 days. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take 30, or I'm sorry, 25,000, divide that by 31, get a daily rate, $806.45. Simply multiply that by four. So there's the amount due, 32.25.80. I'm not gonna round. So we're gonna say, uh, tenant shall pay on the 28th, which is the day moving in, and we said 32.28.80, 32.25.80. And then keep in mind that, you know, plus any taxes, so they're gonna tax that small proration. So let's figure that out real quick. So we're gonna take that same number, 32.25.80. Um, I'm gonna clear that out in times 0.0175%. 56.45. So we're gonna pay some sales tax, 56.45. And then totaling, and we're just gonna add that up. We're gonna come up with this number here, 
25. For the prorated time beginning on the 28th and which ends on March 31st. Initial rent payment, here's where it gets a little bit weird. So if you're doing a proration for the end of the month and you're like, well, you know, there's only four days in March, you might wanna charge April rent on top of that. And so that's something you might wanna do. Um, you can do that in this example. I'm, why don't we go ahead and do that? Why don't we just charge for the prorated amount and then we're gonna charge for April as well. And then let's just see what the result of that is. Um, so we're gonna take the initial amount here, which is, remember, it's 32,2580. And so we'll take the 32,2580 plus the 25,000 that's due for April. That's 28,2580. So 28,000. $225.80. Security deposit. Side note about security deposits. In Arizona, it is illegal. It is against the Landlord-Tenant Act for the landlord to require more than a month and a half worth of security deposit. That does not mean that as a tenant representative, you can't offer more than the one and a half months. It simply means that the tenant, I'm sorry, the landlord cannot require more than a month and a half from the tenant. And so um, if you got a situation where somebody's got bad credit, but they have a chunk load of cash, and then when you put more down as a security deposit, you can say, hey, Larry, landlord, um, you know, here's $50,000. Here's two months worth of security deposit just to make you feel comfortable. Or if it's a furnished unit, something with, you know, priceless artwork or artifacts or something like that, you can offer more of a security deposit and they can accept it. That's, not, that's totally fine. Uh, so let's put security deposit in here, $25,000. Um, let's say that Tammy's got a pet. I don't know, let's say a pet deposit of $500. Cleaning deposit, now that's different than a cleaning fee. Cleaning deposits are refundable. It says on line 67, refundable security deposit. Line 72 is where we start talking about the non-refundable fees. So I'm gonna go ahead and charge Tammy a $250 cleaning fee that is non-refundable, that's a one-time fee. And then I'm gonna charge her a pet fee of 250 bucks. Let's just say she's got a cute little bulldog like that guy right over there and they're stinky and they just stink and they get a clean up after them. So let's charge her 250 bucks to do that. And then you can charge other fees too, you know, if there's like a uh, restocking fee or something like that, if you have a furnished rental, you can go ahead and do that. Um, you know, use your best judgment. And then uh, that is pretty much it. So what we're gonna do is sales tax charge on the initial rent payment. So that 228, or I'm sorry, $20,225.80. Multiply that by 0 0.0175 and you're gonna get a number of 493.95. We're just gonna plug that in there, 493.95 because the tax rate is 1.75% and the taxable amount is this amount right here. I'm literally just gonna copy and paste. Total required payment is the sum of all of these things. And uh, one thing I'll give Zipforms a shout out for is they actually added the stuff in. Dotloop doesn't do that for us. Let's just go ahead and just do that right now. Um, we're gonna say this is 28,225.80 plus 25,000 plus the $500 pet fee plus the uh, $250 cleaning fee plus $250 uh, pet cleaning fee, and then we're gonna say the taxes, 493.95. And so you're looking at 54,719.75. So we're just gonna put that required payment in here. 54,719.75, I think is what it was here. Let's double check that math. Yep, good to go. And then let's just say, you know, we did give him $1,000 earnest money. We're gonna subtract out that thousand because it's already been paid to the landlord. And then that makes the balance due, easy math, 53,719. 75 and that's gonna be due on the day they move in typically you know this is they're moving in on saturday maybe the guy wants it you know on the day before that friday so let's just go ahead and say that's the case we put it in friday there refundable deposit held by the landlord unless you guys do have a broker's trust account if you guys are doing property management some of you guys have that that's totally cool use that then uh, application credit background fees and stuff like that Word to the wise, do not charge um, application fees for the sake of charging application fees. There have been instances, not that any of you watching would ever do this, but where uh, people would solicit applications on a lease that was already leased, a property that was already leased, and they just collect application fees all day. I don't do that. I use TransUnion Smart Move. It's a third party. I'm not recommending them. I'm just saying that's a tool that you can use. Uh, I think they charge like 45 bucks, and then the landlord can sign up for the account and solicit applications directly through that. It'll give like a, a recommend or you know a caution or whatever it is. It does pull background, it does pull credit. I think it's like 45 bucks. Let's go ahead and put 45 bucks on line number 91. Um, now Tammy did have a pet and so we're gonna check box uh, line 103 and just say Bulldog on line number 104. Let's go ahead and say that there's some insurance required on this thing because we know there's liability. There's a very, it's called strict liability with pets and so 
you know, let's give $100,000 minimum coverage for that, and that is it. Keys, very simple. Let's do some door keys, maybe two of those things. Let's say there's a mailbox somewhere around the property, and say there's a key for that. Let's say that there's an entry gate, I don't know, maybe one key for that. Other, other could be something like a key fob, um, you know, if there's like a special remote in order to get into the pool or something like that, you could use that space for that. We'll just say key fob in here, and then um, go ahead and say that there's like a three car garage. So maybe there's three car openers, three garage door openers. Uh, utilities line number 115, this is all utilities except tenant to pay all utilities except. And so if water, sewer, and trash is included in the rent, you would put that in here. If it's a furnished rental where it's all included, you would put Wi-Fi and you know cable TV or direct TV or whatever it is. And then you know all water, sewer, gas, trash, all that stuff in here. So let's go ahead and just throw in water, sewer, and trash. And then let's go ahead and save that in there. Um, hey, let's have a quick, very quick conversation about HOAs. Story time. So I had a tenant, I was representing a tenant, and the tenant had a huge couch. He was moving into Optima Camel View, which is a condo complex right here in Scottsdale. And um, what's really interesting is the couch was a little bit oversized. Instead of taking the stairs up to the fifth floor, he decided to jam it in the elevator. And so there's a little emergency hatch on top of the elevator. And so when he pushed that uh, couch up in there, it activated the emergency hatch. What that did was lock all the elevators in the entire building down the Scottsdale Fire Department showed up to rescue him because they thought he was stuck in the elevator. And then um, the HOA proceeded to charge him $1,600 because they had to have Otis Elevator come back out and reset the entire elevator system for $1,600. And so had we not put a little bit of verbiage in this line, line 117 or 118, um, you know, potentially the landlord could have been stuck with that violation. So let's put something very, very easy in there, something like, Tenant responsible for his or her own action or inaction that results in an HOA fine, something like that to kind of cover and make very, very clear who's responsible for the fines. I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick. All right, so we're done with that. So let's go back through pool maintenance. This is a single family home. Um, and so there's probably gonna be a pool. So typically uh, the landlords are gonna to wanna to take care of that stuff. So let's go ahead and make the landlord responsible for that. Again, landlord's probably gonna to wanna to do the pest control. Landlord's probably wanting to do the maintenance to make sure that's a, all kept up. You know, you can't ass uh, assign that to the tenant or if you're in a single family community or townhouse community where the HOA takes, takes care of the front yard, just select that, it's very, very simple. Other, this might be like a patio or something like that. If you're in a high rise condo and then um, you know it's got a little patio or balcony, you can put that in there and maybe the tenant would be responsible or something like that. Here guys, it's literally just boilerplate, just initials. Um, let's go ahead and select line number 178 uh, and just assume that the property was constructed before 1978. For this example, you guys should be sending out the pamphlet uh, for lead-based paint, go into Google, takes two seconds, uh, lead-based paint pamphlet, and then send that PDF to your client included in all of this documentation. Very, very easy. You're gonna wanna assign initials here, uh, kind of in between line 180 and 181 and not down here. I see that mixed up quite a bit. And so then let's talk about smoke detectors. Yeah, it's got some smoke detectors. Yep, it's got some carbon monoxide, but nope, doesn't have any fire sprinklers. Going on, down, this is all boilerplate stuff. Um, quick note about additional terms real quick. So I had a very interesting case where we had a buyer make an offer on a property in Scottsdale. This is recently, this happened last week. The seller accepted, but in the additional terms, they put their own verbiage. My buyer's agent was sharp and he had watched my previous video for the uh, residential purchase contract and he put none in there. And so it caught it. So it, you know, our offer was no additional terms, but they put additional terms in the additional term sheet and then signed it and sent it back as an accepted contract. That is not the proper way to do that. Um, and so this will cover your butt. I don't like blank spaces, by the way. It does give agents the opportunity to put verbiage or change something in the contract. And then as he said, she said, so always cover your butt and always put in here none. And that will cover your butt, okay? The same thing down here. Let's put in five for five days. You know, inspection periods, and anything that has a blank line in it, you should put none or NA or you know, the actual number. So if it's saying five days and you leave it blank, put five days in there, it locks that, that cell, locks that field. And then let's give them some time to respond. Let's just say the 18th and let's call it 9 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Question for you, what is Mountain Standard Time? So what was interesting is also last week the time changed. And so now we are in Pacific Standard Time and Mountain Standard Time is Denver, Colorado. Um, and so is 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Arizona time or is it 10 p.m. or is it 8 a.m. or I'm sorry, 8 p.m. And so that is a question you have to ask yourself. The technical answer is you have put Mountain Standard Time in there. 
9 p.m. Mountain Standard Time in the summertime here is 8 p.m. And so you shorten that by an hour. Okay, so just be very, very aware of that. I've gone ahead and my dilute pre-fills all my information in there. I did put the agency confirmation. And so quick word about agency. Um, if you're doing dual representation where you have the landlord and you have the tenant, make sure you're doing limited or consent to limited to representation as your agency document. Um, same thing applies if you're you know, in the same firm and you've got two agents from the same firm that are doing a deal together. You still have to do the uh, consent for limited representation. On any transaction, any trans it doesn't matter what, doesn't matter if it's a listing for a rental or for a sale, it doesn't matter if you're showing people property as a buyer or whatever the situation is or as, as tenants, you absolutely have to, have to on every transaction disclose what your agency relationship is. That is a state mandated, mandated thing. I've had people try to argue that with me. Um, that is non-arguable, if that's even a word. Um, it's gotta be done on every single file, so just put that stuff in there and cover your butt, you're good to go. Um, and so then put the uh, broker on behalf of the landlord's contact information in there. And also down here on line 317, if there is a property management company involved, please put their contact info in there. We've had so many situations where we have represented the tenant, a pipe breaks or a toilet gets clogged or something happens and they're trying to reach out to the property management company but they don't know who it is. They don't have the owner's contact info because they have that buffer in there. They have that property management company in place. Um, please put their information in there. It's gonna make your life very, very easy in the future. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, some things that people miss a lot of times would be, number one, the date that is due, um, and then also the initials on every page, and that includes at the bottom of page eight here, and so I think that's very, very, very important. Just make sure you're paying attention to the details. And so that's generally it. I mean, it's a fairly easy contract. If you guys have any questions on this stuff, be sure to let me know. I'm always available via uh, uh, social media, especially on Instagram. I'm, I'm really good about getting back to people. So, um, Or call your broker or call somebody else, one of your mentors and they can help you out. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I always appreciate you. I hope you have a prosperous day. Go out there and crush it, and we'll see you here next time. Take care, see ya.